So, welcome to the first official informal podcast of the Cryptic Canticles, where we discuss our current projects, uh, possibly future projects, and I'm here with uh, four out of the five Cryptic Canticles this evening. Uh, one of our members was unavailable to attend, uh, Sean, but uh, let's start with Liz. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, um, I'm Liz Rischel. I am the story continuity supervisor for Dracula, which means that um, I'm in charge of looking over the story to make sure that we are consistent with our recording, that uh, that we are recording with respect to what's coming next, and I'm in, I was in charge of highlighting the characters' lines within the novel, and I write the synopses um, for each day that the entries come out. And I just want to clarify, what, what we're doing, this project, is different and unique as a radio play because it's being released during the corresponding days that the journal entries are written. Right, so we had to break them up. Uh, Sean, who is not here, worked with me on this because I gave him the highlighted book and he broke it into scripts that correspond on each day with the characters' lines isolated, the way an actor might usually read them. But, uh, but it made his job a lot easier to have someone go in ahead of time and say, this is all Mr. Swale's lines, Nina interjects here, and then we're back to Mr. Swale's for three more paragraphs. So while doing that, I was reading a lot for content to make sure that I was very familiar with the story um, from a purely technical standpoint. Okay. okay, and give us a little bit of background about your performance experience, your, your history of performance. Okay, well I, I largely come from a background, so my background is kind of interesting because it's, it's both education and opera performance. I did education in my undergrad, uh, music education, and then um, afterwards I sort of took that passion for making music accessible that you learn in education and applied it to um, my passion for opera and the performing arts specifically is in regards to singing. So from there it was a natural transition into using my voice for other things and of course you act a lot on the stage too so I wanted to be able to do all of that acting. So I also play Lucy Westenra um, within the, the story itself um, and uh, yeah, it's pretty fun. Okay. Our next member is Gwen Schmidt. Please tell us about yourself. Um, I'm Gwen Schmidt. Um, and well, first, I am I am the director and uh, voice coach for Dracula. Um, this means that I'm doing a whole lot of watching to see if the the words that are coming out of the actor's mouth, if they are actually to be, they're able to be clearly heard, but also if the clarity of the emotion is brought out in the text, because 99% of what you see when you do an acting on stage or in film or in TV is that body language does most of that communication, but we don't have that, so we're losing 90 to 99 percent of the communication. It is entirely on the text, and it's getting the actors to recognize that we need to have the the text drawn out in a way that it can be understood, and in a way, because it's Victorian text, a lot of it's also archaic, there's archaic uses, there's archaic ways of looking at it, uh, making sure that it is listenable by the readers and it understandable just from the text itself. Okay, okay. And what is your background as far as performance goes? Well, oddly, I have a computer science degree, and I work in computers by day, so I'm kind of um, unusual in the performance world in that I'm not a performance main person, but I have been singing since I was very young. Um, I first was on Pittsburgh Opera stage when I think I was eight or nine years old um, as a child's part for Carmen, and... Uh, I did that through Children's Festival Chorus, and later I was in Junior Mendelssohn, so I, I did very serious singing throughout my childhood and sort of continued that as a hobby in my adult life, and I have certainly performed with everyone in this room. Many times. Many times, yes. Dr. Croft and several yards and other, other organizations. <laughs> so True, that's true. Uh, that's how I met you, actually. Yeah. yeah. And all of you, Yeah. to come to think of it. Um, so I'm Judy Kirby, I'm the newest member of the Cryptic Canticles, and I am sort of the behind the scenes, whatever gap needs to be filled, and producing slash uh, directing this 
informal podcast. We're probably going to do a couple more of these as the series continues mm -hmm. to keep our listeners informed about what's going on and where this is all coming from. Uh, my background, I actually did go to school for vocal performance. I had one year of music ed. Uh, and now I happen to be in the IT slash tech slash software industry <laughs> by day. And I'm also a full-time mom. I have three kids and they keep me extremely busy and I love it. Uh, I do, I, I have been performing for over the past couple of years with the Savoy Arts and with Undercroft. Uh, so I kind of have the best of both worlds. Uh, so that's me and now our final member, Bonnie Bogovich. Hey, I'm Bonnie Bogovich. Common mispronunciation, but it's cool. 90% of the population always. I should just change how I say my name. No, no, no. <laughs> but yeah, so I've been with the cryptic thing, cryptic canticles since before we found a name for it. So I'm part of the original trio, which is Liz, me, and Gwen, who are sitting in this room. By the way, if you hear a noise, that we are in my living room as we speak. And if a bell noise goes by, we do not have a tambourine player. It is my cat who really likes being present when there's a microphone going. So pardon any of any of that. <laughs> so, si though Simon is very gothy, he's he's a black cat. Tuxedo cat. He, and he's a tuxedo, so he dressed up really nice for this for this yeah. podcast. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess my background, I, used to, I, I primarily thought I would, growing up, end up in theater. Uh, I was always a stage crew junkie. I was also a multimedia head and AV club person, and I, I was always involved with anything that had something to do with filming or, uh, you know, backdrops, sound design, you name it. And then whenever I ended up going to college, I switched gears at the last minute. Instead of pursuing a theater degree, I went for music composition with a multimedia master's and a combo program at Duquesne University, which is where I met Liz. Yay! Um, and... I started thinking that what I would be working on most of my life was uh, music and audio productions that also worked for stage that had some sort of a technological element. So like projection visuals with a click tracked accompaniment. Um, I did some pieces that involved live playing with you know projection stuff. After college I toured with a couple of troops and worked for some theater companies that focused on that. But um, you know I, I got pulled back into the tech industry for a bit, and I actually did some stuff that focused on voice for a while. I got a desk job doing voiceover for database programming software tutorial videos. Wee! It is as exciting <laughs> as it sounds. So while I was doing that thrilling job, uh, Liz and I talked and we decided to write uh, we worked together on a, an original production called The Zombie Opera, Evenings in Quarantine, The Zombie Opera. And it was a, hey, surprise, a theater production that involved some sort of projection element that also <laughs> followed a click track. So it was like the thing that I wanted to, to do. Um, and that luckily helped me meet a whole bunch of actors and other such people. Along the way, I started doing uh, sound design and voice for video games. But I also, on my free time, started doing a lot of stuff with the Savoyers and Undercroft Opera, and I met people like Judy, and Gwen was like, oh my god, we're doing singing together, because she was also part of Undercroft. Yeah, the three and of us have known each other, me, Bonnie, and Gwen have known each other since, for like years. Oh my god. Years and years We used years. to go clubbing together all the time, and board game nights. And yeah, more than a decade. More than a decade we've known no, each other. it's almost, it's getting close to two. Uh, yeah. We've known <laughs> each other a long time. <laughs> Um, but yeah, what, but what was neat is um, the more I was doing stuff with video games and, and theater combined, the more I, I kept wanting to work on projects were, that were only voice, because voice actors uh, can do so much, and there's so much potential, especially like right now, I've sort of been getting a bit of press online for working on um, audio interactive adventure games that only use sound and are used on devices like the Echo and the Google Home, and... It's just so much fun. Like, I worked on a Sherlock Holmes project called the Baker Street Experience, and a lot of the audience response was, man, there's so much you can do with good acting. And even, and even it doesn't even have to be good acting. It's just something beyond a robot reading the words of a book to you, yes. like actually having a real person engaging you. And, and also, hey, sound effects are still cool. Remember those old radio plays? Those are still relevant right now. People still dig that stuff. And I usually go on a rant about 
how much I love the Hitchhiker's Guide series and any anything that's ever, like Doctor Who from BBC. They put tons of budget into really well produced radio plays, and they're still popular today. People like that makes a long car ride tolerable. Oh yes, so mm. much better. And whenever we started working on things like talking about this Dragula project, I was like, oh my god, this is like the perfect thing. We could take something that some people are shunned away from because they're told the book is long and eh, it's an old classic. Why would I want to listen to that? It's going to be read by some musty old reader dude and I'm going to be bored halfway through it. It's like, well, what if we cast it amongst a ton of voice actors and make it yeah. really fun? Now, when did, you, when did you start to think about that? At what point? In the past last year. year. Last okay. year. Well, it, actually, I, I thought about it during the reading of Dracula when we did it reading chronologically. Yeah. I mean, so, a few, I guess, what was that three years ago? Three, this is, oh, two, three years, two years ago. ago. And this is all Liz. Two, three years ago. Yeah, yeah two years ago, out. I had an idea. Well, three years ago, I did this myself. But then two years ago, um, I had the idea. I made, like, a Facebook group, like an event. Yeah. Um, for whoever wanted to, to, it was called the Dracula Challenge. And it was reading the book chronologically, only reading the dates on the date that they're written, um, so which hard. turned out to be a lot harder than I expected it to be, <laughs> yeah. because really there's hard. a lot that's out of order. Yeah. So then you turn the page after the end of June, and you're like, oh my gosh, there's a lot from May, and I miss it all. <laughs> you yeah. have to go and back we, and reread. We did find we did find things. We found some resources. Had, yeah, where people had already broken that out for us, and we also had a free audio book. To follow along, yeah. But the audio book, yeah, the audio book was going back and forth, and I was trying to do both, read yeah. and then listen to the audio book, and I gave up on the audio book because it was just too much. It's too hard to go back and forward in yeah. in, in audio form. And that's where I started getting the idea. Let's do this ourselves. It yeah. started out with well, maybe we should just um, make a chronological thing. So if we want to do this again, we have an audio book that's chronologically set up. Yeah. And I didn't want to use someone else's for that purpose. Purpose. And then Bonnie and I were talking during Origins last year, and that's when she was like, let's make it a radio play. Well, and <laughs> and, and why year, were we talking about Dracula at Origins last year, Gwen? I don't want to discuss that. <laughs> but, but it's, we can briefly say Wait. that um, the one reason why we were extra Dracula fever was Liz, Gwen, and me were part of a very small libretto team, which, yeah. was, which was pretty much the three of us and Mary Beth of yeah. uh, Cedarburg uh, from Undercroft Opera. And Whose they voice did, you'll hear soon. Whose yeah. who's voice you will hear in an upcoming episode. Okay, it's the next one, I think. Yeah. yeah. We got yeah. to listen to some of those edits last night. Readers, you're in for a, you're in for a treat. Anyway, <laughs> beyond, beyond us gushing about Mary Beth's awesome screaming talents, uh, the, we were part of a team that rewrote, or, well, didn't rewrite. We wrote, uh, we created an original libretto to go with Don Giovanni by Mozart to have it changed to be based on the story of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah, so it was, it was an amalgamation of, of Don Giovanni yeah. As Dracula. It was sort of a fusion. Yeah. yeah. But if you're familiar with Don Giovanni, it actually cleans up the story quite a bit. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. It yeah. makes it actually um, watchable by <laughs> by more age groups. Yeah. Like and kids could watch it and not be horrified. And yeah. it was it was funny how quickly Don Giovanni was able to be like there wasn't a lot of extra work to make it convincing that those characters were oh, swapped. No, some of the text in the original Italian was almost already creepy enough. Yeah, just yeah. we just translated it and it would just worked perfectly. It was great. It yeah. flowed. Yeah, and it was fantastic. I want to note that it did get very good reviews. The libretto. The libretto got fabulous reviews. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was I was very yeah. pleased that all of the performers in that show took that transition very seriously. You mm -hmm. would you would sometimes yeah. expect that some somebody might have been like. I wish we were doing the original. But if they did, they never said it, and they committed 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. very pleased. And with, some were very happy to see Fangs on some of the cast members. Oh, that was, yeah. yeah. That was a lot of it was fun. able to create some staging opportunities that you yeah. might not ordinarily and, see. And good excuses to use big capes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so over that process of, of working the libretto, we were like, we should just do, instead of a fusion, let's, let's do another project that's yeah. just Dracula. Making taking the things that we really love that we didn't get to explore in this project as as fully as we as we would like to, and just make it all about that. Yeah, because there's so much good in there. And I don't think like if we hadn't had to chug, almost one night a week or more on the translation into making something fit. I don't think we would have had that so fresh in our brains that we would have been as passionate to kick this off as soon yeah. as we did, because we kind of decided to do it. 
I remember thinking, oh crap, the first episode has to go out in like a month and a half. We've got to start casting <laughs> yeah, we, this thing. We, we did actually uh, get, get going on this really late. Because so. we, oh yeah. A lot of the questions I get from people who are listening, they're like, so when did you finish the recording for it? I'm like, well, we're still recording. <laughs> we're still in the no, process. We generally, we finish the recording for it about a week ahead of the episode. Hey, that's <laughs> great though, because there's a lot of parts that we hadn't cast. Yeah. And people uh-huh. heard it, and, and then they're like, can I be oh, involved? Yeah. yeah. So if we did all of that in advance, we would we would have missed all of those opportunities yeah, for those people. people. A lot of folks that we've added uh, in the last couple of weeks were brought to us because they were like, oh my god, that looks like so much fun. Please, how do I audition for this? Yeah. Or, oh, I'm friends with so-and-so and they're in the cast and, and it just sounds amazing. And yeah. It was nice to get that reaction. Right. Especially yeah. when they're reacting to the product that they that they already like. That they yes. already love. And they're like, I want to yeah. I want to be involved with this if you'll have me. So, th- so that's one advantage. The, the disadvantage is going to be when we get to the crunch time of September. Oh my gosh, September 20th is going to be a <laughs> doozy of a day. It's like three chapters. <laughs> yeah, so Tell we're, me about we're, it. we're now trying to frantically work ahead. We've, we've been recording all this week. Well, it gives me that. great appreciation for mm-hmm. listening to one of my favorite radio broadcast uh, things I think the BBC did was The Hobbit. Ooh, yeah, Hobbit. And you hear all those. So those you have to imagine those people are that's their full time job. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I oh. actually I'm watching Family Guy as like my throwaway show while I like, thoughts around the house or go to sleep. And now every time I'm watching it, I I can just see people behind the mic with their headphones on. <laughs> Yeah, it is funny when you, can, when you can see behind the cracks, yeah. behind the curtain, into those types of things. Yeah, yeah well, it's, that's it's, the challenges, right? I mean, as far as this experience goes, mm-hmm. um, Gwen, what do you think was your most challenging or the thing that you've learned the most from so I've far? never directed before, so um, doing directing has been kind of really interesting. Um, one of the things that I've actually found directing is a lot of people think great actors are the ones who walk in the door and immediately get it but that's not actually what my experience has been as a director my experience has been the great actors are the ones that work with you and um and they work with what they you know they were it's a team effort still mm-hmm. um and it, people think of the star as being the star and doing it on their own it's actually no it's still a team effort with the entire cast it's a team effort with the entire production team and we're all working together to make sure that we we get it and we have a lot of fantastic actors a yeah. lot of them. I can't say anyone is, is any better than the other. And um, and everybody works with you so well. And that's been the best experience. But it's been a challenge for me to walk in with these really experienced actors. And many of them are experienced voice actors and being like, I'm new. Hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and learning how to do this um, as we go. But you're the one with the vision. Yeah. A good actor, luckily, will, will understand that the director's vision will inform the tone that they yeah. need to strike. And yeah. keeping the tone consistent is, is one of the most important things. That, that too. I, but I also really enjoy the way the actors take what my vision is and then ch- make it themselves. Yes. And the big one I have for that is Mar- uh, is Renfield, Mark Harris. And my vision of Renfield is that he, if you read the text, if you really read into the text, Bram Stoker is actually much more brilliant than you might think. Um, Renfield's not crazy. He is not even one iota crazy. He's mesmerized. But he's an incredibly rational, intelligent man. And he goes into and out of these mesmerizations. And when he's out of the mesmerization, he's like very rational, very lucid, very coherent, and had, and very educated. But when the spell takes hold. And when the spell takes hold, he gets a little bit more ranty. But he even still has a grain of, even there's this sing song, he's telling you exactly what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and... It's fascinating, and my thought was to make it much more straight than it is. So I told Mark about that, and he took it, and he is playing it like that, except he's Mark. And it's coming out so creepy, it's magnificent. Like, <laughs> when you get the flexibility, yeah. and when an actor's flexible enough to take the direction yeah. and give it a twist or spin or something yeah. that you didn't see coming... I think that's exactly. Well, it's also exactly. nice because it's like there's a reason why we pick these people to be the people they are. Yeah. yeah. Because we know that we like Mark. We like what he naturally does for that character. Yeah. Um, the same with our other actors. What they naturally do is, is you, you already, know it's already the character. <laughs> you know what I decided Mark, I, I, I wanted Marcus Renfield? Is when he was doing um, the reciting line in, in Patience. 
where he does the oh, creepy reciting yeah. line to patients and he's trying to scare away the girls and he's making it very creepy and he had that creepy voice I'm like I want him as Renfield <laughs> <laughs> I think we interpreted that scene differently. Yeah. <laughs> so Bonnie, as as our sort of editor, and and what well, what do you find? What have you found as the most challenging from this experience? Layers and layers and layers of stuff. I I, I will say the one of the most fun and most challenging parts is trying to find the best way to put a ton of. And sometimes not a ton of sound effects and background sound and music and stuff in so that it doesn't bog down the voice and still lets the actor be the main thing. Mm -hmm. Because even though we're enhancing everything with music and with sound effects, like even when we were recording uh, the, uh, the three brides or the three sisters vampire sequence, we had everything from apples and like baby crying played by Liz Rachel. Thank you. And, um, I was pleased with that dying It came baby. out really good. <laughs> yeah, uh, but we had so many bits and we had takes of people whispering and, and like making kissy sounds into the microphone and those were fun by the way. And, uh, <laughs> but if we put but it's like yeah those are all great but if you put everything in 100% all the time at all the time it's just overwhelming. So it, So the fun and time-consuming part of my job is like choosing and picking and knowing when to wave in and out certain bits like here's the part where now the heartbeat has to be higher than the kissy stuff but then the sucky stuff can come back like after that it's like what matches the words of what Jesse's saying but what helps him what enhances it um, without everything being turned up to 11 <laughs> without everything being turned up to 11 because uh, even though the sound effects being added secondarily are adding to the sequence, you don't want them to completely take over and take away from the words because the words are still what we're being guided by. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's finding that balance, I'd say, is the challenge. And when you've got things like, oh gosh, the carriage sequence, we were just talking about that before we started recording. There's some of those, like, we have this one episode that goes on for like 20 minutes. That's and one of my favorite parts. Yeah, there's, we've got villagers, we've got people like saying curse words, we've got horses running, we've the got a bat the we got, we got two carriages almost overrunning each other, then you got wolves, oh, and there's like <laughs> flames in the forest, you know, you yes. got all this stuff, but trying to choose it uh, to, so that it doesn't just sound like a wall of sound and and make it so that if someone's driving in their car, like they go, ooh, it doesn't oh, that was cool. Doesn't um, overwhelm Jesse Buddington as Jonathan Harper. And, I, and you never want to overwhelm mm -hmm. Jesse because Jesse's voice is amazing. Yeah, he's he's just such a study. He's reading it so steady. It's amazing. Yeah. And I'd say, like, uh, sometimes the deadlines are crazy, too, because when yeah. we started, we had some days where it was, like, back-to-back -back stuff. And sometimes there's two different characters reading in one entry, so it's yeah. trying to get all the recordings Making sure that everything's and, all rounded up. Yeah, and Sean... Le of, yeah, one of Sean Lenhart, yeah, who's not here, his role. One of his ro one of Sean's roles has been... Be uh, well, one of his roles, we already said, was helping make, like, script versions of... Well, more like theatrical reading script versions for the actors to read from the book so that they yeah. can view it in more of a uh, movie script manner, which helps them and also me when I'm editing. But Sean has also taken on the additional task of helping me with cleaning up and polishing uh, takes from our external actors and anyone, like, and from that I mean anyone who's recording in their home studios around the United States. I shouldn't say that, around the world, because soon we'll have Brian Diamond, who's recording from Scotland. Mm. Um, Ooh, okay. He's from Scotland. Um, but Brian, he's recording off-site, but Sean takes all of those recordings that we upload to Google, to a very large Google Drive folder, and helps pick the best takes, and takes the, uh, you know, all if anybody coughed a lot, or they had to re-hiccup a word, he helps stitch some of those sentences together. So currently anything recorded in my home studio is that that's all done on my side, but he's been helping me with a ton of super important dialogue. So without that, I'd probably still be editing at episode one right now. And on top of that, he also plays John Seward. Dr. Oh, and he plays Dr. John, John Seward. Seward. The man who gets to talk about Renfield. Yes. Yeah. And I also play the role of uh, Mina Harker, or, well, Mina Murray, later on Mina Harker. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I have a part too, though I'm also one of the uncredited extra whispers of vampire ladies in, in the episode. Because <laughs> <laughs> I found out later that we forgot to, we didn't have any whispering from Mary 
Mary Lou. So Oops. I faked um, a Mar- I did a Mary Lou whisper impression. Okay, there we go. That works. Okay. Oh, I forgot. I also yeah. happened to be the one of the the main brides of Dracula. Dracula. Oh yeah, yeah. Judy's yeah. one of the sexy Dracula brides. I got the suck on that apple. She got that to totally fun. destroy an apple. Talk to talk about not so much challenging but fun for me is figuring out how to make some of these noises. And whenever we said, "Oh man, do we have anything to bite into?" and I unintentionally cleaned off and, and put three apples earlier that day in a bowl in my kitchen. But then it was like, I have apples. <laughs> and that became the sound of eating a baby. And Mary actually choked on hers. So that was and, then Mary, and, Mary, and poor Mary started, she, she was, um, she she's start- actually choking on her apple while she's eating the baby in the episode. So just yeah. that's so everyone and knows. And, and as soon as the tape was over, she started coughing. Like, she, oh my she's God. a trooper. She actually, she did it. And she she finished. And, and more tapes after that. <laughs> yeah. The apple still in her throat. And, and the sad, the sad, the sad truth is sometimes all of that long, awesome stuff goes down into like one, one or two seconds. Yeah. Of the sound oh, yeah. But later, the, when we figure out blooper time or I will make... I don't know, a techno remix of apple eating or something. Oh, we, exactly. we will have... There, you'll get to hear all the glory of... <laughs> <laughs> we, have lots of like, we have lots of people in British accents stumbling into horrible curse words when something goes wrong. There was a lot of, swe- there was a lot of swearing. Um, I think Nate, Nate Chambers uh, had one of his first directing sections the other day, and I'm pretty sure we had some profanity. Going on to oh, the yeah, that, that was funny. But he did fabulous. T- I mean, Gwen already said we we were lucky to work with some professionals, but oh, we yeah. also have some people who are doing this uh, so they can get experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they've never done it before or been directed before. Mm-hmm. So it's like, hey, here's an opportunity to see what it's like to get feedback and have to oh, work yeah. with stuff. Yeah. And, and, you know. But it's been, everybody's been doing so well. Mm-hmm. How about our Dracula? I do want to talk about the Dracula. Oh, Dracula. Dracula. Jeff Brenneman. Jeff Brenneman. Amazing. So I found Jeff Brenneman through Ashley, Ashley Lynn Watts, who is one of the people I work with uh, for the Materia Collective. And she was friends with him because he does, I guess, funny voices over Twitch sometimes. And he was on, and he was, he auditioned to be on a track I did for Materia, which was in a tribute to Undertale, uh, for Metaton, which is this robot David Bowie type character. And I needed a sad ghost called Nobstablook to say, Metaton, I love you. And it turns out he nailed it. He did all of these voices, but then he also provided me like eight takes of different creatures of the night. Like monsters going like Metaton ah! and Metaton, we love you. And like all this stuff. Between him and Brian Diamond were all of the characters in like this crowd sequence. So of course both of them are now in our Dracula project. But when Jeff said he wanted to try out for stuff, he said, I could actually do humans too. Could I try out for Dracula? And I was like I was like, you wanna be Dracula? And I'm thinking in my head, oh I want to suck your blood. Mm. But he sounded amazing, and he He's doing. he did a phone audition. Uh, we were sitting at Gwen's house and called in, and we were just like, we poked and prodded him a lot. And yeah, then he followed it exactly. Mm-hmm. Totally, totally blown away by you know. It just goes to show that just because you may be used to hearing someone in one format when they do yeah. voice acting, that you never know what they'll throw at you, and yeah. be very happy and. He's also just a lot of fun to work with. We always oh my god, so yes. much laughter during those episodes. So Brennan, if you're listening to this, we love you. Thank you so much for, for being not just an awesome nobs look for me uh, last year, yeah, but yeah, for yeah. being a fantastic Dracula. All right, so, so we should probably go on the next one. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I was going to mention. Uh, I want to just clarify where we are at this stage in the process. Um, you know, where are part we of the story is coming next. Well, we're still in... Uh, Jonathan Harker is still stuck in Dracula's castle. He's stuck in Dracula's castle for, forever. forever. And that's part of the reason why I love <laughs> this project so much, is because if you're reading the book, it's easy for you to, to turn the page and it's a month later. Yeah. And you don't really get the scale of how long he's been gone. And when you read Mina saying, I'm kind of going crazy because my yeah. fiancé has just been gone without a word for all this time. and then But then you listen to it day by day and you feel his life slipping by it's really yeah. it's really a thing and in movies they usually lump a lot of the Jonathan Harker stuff together anyway so you it's can't really tell like, how long it's been yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it's very fast 
So the part of the story that we're in is, is that Jonathan has now begun to realize the deal um, with Dracula. He's suspicious of him, but Dracula doesn't know it quite yet because he thinks Jonathan's kind of dumb. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but he has begun... Um, he, has, he has started to... The extent of Dracula's knowledge at this point of, of what Jonathan knows is a little bit uncertain. But he's sort of setting Jonathan up to be a bit more of a prisoner, more overtly. He stole his clothes. He stole all his paper. Um, he made him write letters saying that he made he's it, yeah. happily staying for a couple of months. No thing to worry about. And now, oh. um, on the 24th, <laughs> we'll see him set up a little bit more mischief that's going to come back to Jonathan in a bad way if Jonathan's not careful. Spoilers. Great. Yeah. Okay. So you can find out more about the project and us on the website, www.crypticanticles.com. We also have a Facebook page, uh, the Dracula Radio Play, I believe. If you yep, Google Dracula that Radio or, Play. Or, or do Facebook search, we're up there. And we're on Twitter as Cryptic Canticles, but only with one C in the middle, because it turns out if you put both C's in, you would can't put the whole name in. There's a uh, maximum character limit for names. Cryptic oh. Canticles. So it's Cryptic Canticles. <laughs> cryptic Canticles. <laughs> Instead of Cryptic Canticles. Yep. <laughs> no good diction here. Yep, sorry. <laughs> uh, Twitter doesn't follow diction or Twitter doesn't follow grammar. anything really standard. I, it's I, its own thing. At, at this point also, <laughs> since we're talking about our various medias, I wanted to to point out the beautiful artwork that was created for us by oh, Kwame Bao. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. All that yes. artwork. Is, Kwame was a deer and actually did that in a day. Yeah, he did. We were like, guess what? We forgot to do artwork. <laughs> we need to have it now. <laughs> Turns out iTunes will not let you post a podcast without a piece of art. If you yeah. love someone, you will never do that to him. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what we do. Thank you, Thank you, Kwame. <laughs> so. Well, thank you for joining us, and we hope you will continue to stay up to date on the podcasts. Until next time. And thank you for listening. Thank, thank you. you for listening. Thank you for listening. We need an enjoy your burrito type of a sign off. Like, enjoy. <laughs> thank you. Enjoy your burrito. All right, you suck that apple. <laughs> 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 mm.